And I'm just like, right, mate, just, you're not going to win this. You're not going to get away. Well, before I can think, blink, shit, turn on the lights, he fucking shoots up like a puff adder, <laughs> sticks his fucking right hand. <laughs> puff adder's like a rattlesnake. Straight <laughs> up my fucking pants. You obviously just park in there, check the old twig and berries, park in there like a baby <laughs> pigeon. He's just like, ha ha, none so. <laughs> Fucking little twig and berries I oh, shit you not the old baby pigeons parking in the nest there <laughs> he shoots his hand straight up my fucking pants <laughs> and he grabs my nuts another episode have we uh, published Amy you're getting a little red faced there doll um, have we published the uh, the podcast with the ladies yet no Oh, mm. what are we mm-hmm. what, what are we waiting for? Season two, three. Season, season three. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's good to see you, Andrew. Good to see you, Kevin. All right, so we're here today. Rad, Unpossible fifteen gets you fifteen percent off. Tactical distributors. Those pants. Oh Ooh. boy, how good are they? Still my favorites. Yeah. Yep. Sweet socks, my man. Don't have my pink ones, but we'll give these ones a go. Yeah. All right, so uh, Andrew Pringle, Crusader Safaris. You got that John Hill hat on. Johnny Hill. Johnny Hill. Johnny Hill. <laughs> is, is the mic blocking his whole face? He's got, <laughs> and, Andrew. How's that? There we go. Yeah, use that, Set up. use that giraffe height you got. <clears throat> Silence. Is it? It's got to be Jess, 100% Jess. <laughs> it's been two minutes. <laughs> this is, thing's a shit show already. I mean, we, we are fucking the cat. Uh, we're jigging the pig. Uh, where'd you just come from? Jesus. Let me collect myself. Pull myself towards myself. There we go. Wind my neck in. <laughs> is that the correct thing or is it real? That's right. All right. Well, several things. Did you see this chalice that they sent me? Tori, what is this called? I forget the name of them already. Sorry. And they're so kind to me. Yeah. What's it called? Salado Glass. Glassworks. Look at this chalice. They up the game. They send us these custom, blo- I, I guess you blow glass? Yep. No wonder I don't make cups. <laughs> um, so I got a chalice now. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these, thing, these things are beautiful. It's interesting. They sent us these a couple of years ago, and they're wonderful, the one Andrew has. These latest ones, you can tell, man. My man is honing his craft. He's getting good. And I have a chalice. A handmade chalice. Didn't even ask for it. Pimp cup. <laughs> All right. So, Crusader Safaris. The great Rad Robertson and the goat. The, the goat. goat. Tom <laughs> Brady of <laughs> PHing. Came out of retirement. To God, Kevin. On the last hunt. Incredible. We cleaned where, up. Where I mean, was, where we was Radcliffe? I don't know, but I don't think we even missed him. Not, we didn't. Uh uh-uh. uh. I don't know. Where was Rad? So we took the, I don't know, maybe the other podcast is already published by now, by the time people say this. So we took the ladies hunting. So yeah, Rad and Guy, everyone, they were all distracted. You and I, laser focused on hunting. What were there for? Laser focused. Nyala, no, lechery. I don't even know. We shot Let's so well like and so many things. Baboon, number one. Oh, the baboon. That was a great time. <laughs> that was so good. Number one. How was that Lechway shot with that 8.6, huh? With a subsonic. Mm. 200 yards. Mm. Yep. Oh, that video. You should, you should put that little shot in here right now. Oh, my Lord. That was beautiful. It was a great pHing. It was good shooting. Great pHing though. It was decent shooting. It was wonderful pHing. Rad, I heard you were the least successful of all the pHs on the hunt this time. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Andrew, first off, talk into your mic, please, when you... I thought Thomas was about to tell you that. I'm watching, Thomas. Don't Casey. look at Kevin and talk away. Um, I think we <coughs> missed uh, Zebra, Mount Reebok, Waterbuck, <laughs> Blue Wildebeest... Throwing your client under the bus, yeah. No, and the reason we missed is because um, <clears throat> yours truly, instead of clicking it down at the range when he was <laughs> coordinating the sighting in of rifles and doing the scopes, so I would like to he think went up instead of down, so we were a foot over the top. 
I don't, I don't remember any of that. But let's think uh, Seven Seas Brewing here. They hooked us up with this <laughs> this whiskey, limited edition, <laughs> which we started the podcast off with. Your Pilsner there. How's that tasting? Pilsner's good. Very good. Good out of the, what do you say these glasses were? Well, this is a chalice. That, that's a peasant's cup. But um, So I don't, I don't know. Uh, 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 I, the goat of pHing would have confirmed that zero. He, he wouldn't have let the client do it. Well, I, that's I've, all I'm saying. So, but the ladies had a wonderful time. Amy's a straight up killer, as everyone learned on the Motormouth podcast that <laughs> preceded this one. <laughs> now she's doing sign language. I think she's saying Rad's number one. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. Um, so, and we just came back from Dallas Safari Club show. Is that what it's called? Dallas Safari Club? DSC, that's it. What a wonderful time. Well, Andrew. What the hell's with Crusader? Give a little bit of the history, man. Your family coming there. What's going on when you start hunting? Yeah, so, I mean, Crusader's been going for 15 years or so. And uh, my family came over from Scotland in 1820. And uh, after college, went and worked in Canada for a while and sort of figured out that there were a lot of American hunters going up to Canada to hunt whitetail and I sort of looked at that closely and wondered why with their whitetail in America, why they'd be going up to Canada and realized that most American hunters, given the choice, would prefer to hunt animals in big country, free range country where they're wild, indigenous, where they've always been. And we were fortunate to live in an area and it grew to two areas where we could create these big conservancies and give American and other nationalities, I guess most people prefer that, the opportunity to shoot and hunt animals where they're indigenous, where they're free range, where they've always been, which is important. And uh, it's been a, a good model for us and, and something different. We're probably the only people in South Africa that offer that. So, well, so that is, well. so a lot of people don't understand. You go to <coughs> South Africa, most of the places seem like they're high fence. I mean, it can be pretty vast areas. And so you have a lot of free range land, which is awesome. So cattle fencing, which four feet tall, if there's any, and every animal we hunt can get over under that, that all that does is keep cattle in, right? If you provide them with water and you do a good job with the predators and they have food, the cattle are going to stay in any kind of fence. Yeah, exactly that. So, I mean, the, you know, you'd probably equate it to a midwest elk hunt mule deer hunt so it's yeah. south africa it's not a wilderness area the a little bit of cattle ranching some areas have cattle some don't but the the game moves around freely um so by creating the, the, these two conservancies we can now hunt all the species where they're indigenous where they've always been where they free range gives you a better experience it allows people to hunt different camps, different areas, and feels like an authentic hunt. And, and while doing so, you don't give away anything from an experience perspective. You still see as many or more animals. Um, yeah. I think the trophy quality is better. And um, I think given the choice, that's what most people would prefer to hunt or how they'd prefer to hunt. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the first time, in the first time or two, I went to Africa, and it was in Limpopo, another part of the country. <clears throat> so where my house is on your property in the eastern cape it's mountainous it's beautiful you have all these views the terrain is very different than in a lot of other places i've kind of been in south africa uh and i enjoy it better oh the views the pictures the sundowners oh every every everything is beautiful every time we shoot something the backdrop is beautiful if anyone looks at my personal social media or cues it's what are you going to say, Ray? Is that because it's you behind the animal or are you talking about the scenery? Both. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously way more handsome than average, Ray. <laughs> Let's be real. I mean, I don't even work out. Look at me. <laughs> so <laughs> Natural. Well, where were you in Canada? Where did you hunt there? Whew. Up in uh, northern Alberta. feels like I'm there at the moment. I Ooh. haven't uh, seen <laughs> cold for a while. But, you, uh, it's so funny. South African men are tough. Unless it's a little cool. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you guys are the yeah, biggest sissies ever. Uh, a little out of my comfort zone. 
Yeah, so I, and I know I can't even believe you were there. I, I honestly don't believe it. Is yeah, is, I was a little tougher in those days. Mm. I mean, that was ten years ago. Mm. So, uh, oh, that reminds me of when uh, the the story of a, a few hunts ago. What was that? I went to the doctor to get the malaria shot or something, and up here. It's my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to hear about that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Andrew was a professional is, cricketer, which no American's going to know what the hell that means. He yeah. was a professional cricket player in England, and my doctor, who is a, is a sweet Indian fella, um, he asked me what I was doing, where I was going, and I and I was well, I need malaria. I'm going to Africa to hunt, and he, he asked me where because his family, he has family in South Africa who actually have a hunting preserve or something. I don't I don't remember the whole story, but. He said, so he, he knew some of the the hunting outfits, and he asked me, I thought it was strange. He's like, where are you going? I told him. He says, who are you hunting with? I said, Andrew Pringle. He's like, the professional cricketer. <laughs> and I said, what? And he turned around the computer, looked it up. Uh, I think you have a, a Wikipedia page about yeah, your think, professional cricket career. Uh, I think that was probably the biggest coincidence in, in history <laughs> that you met a, a, do- a doctor that heard of me. But no, that, uh, geez, that was long ago. He even knew the teams you played for. It well, was that, amazing. That, that's your second favorite story. I'd pr- appreciate it if you didn't mention your first favorite story. Oh, oh, oh uh, Debbie. Debbie, yeah. We'll yeah leave okay. that for we'll, another we'll time. Skip. I don't know. Maybe we should. No, no. Get Is a that couple the one when he fought in the chick's face? <laughs> <laughs> that was. What a great time. <laughs> okay. Uh, you should maybe change your name for the next uh, <laughs> episode. It, it, it is. She didn't even skip a beat, eh? Uh-uh. I mean, she heard it. it Took was it like a chair. Day. Just, oh, it was so loud. <laughs> she was so dumbstruck. She didn't she know, just, know what to do. She just carried on walking and then it's got. So you probably can't tell here, but Andrew's 6'6. So if you're 5'1. Your your face is at about Andrew's ass. Yeah, and book, uh, book dog probably saved the day there. Fuck, Tori, I'm getting very warm. Could you do me a total solid and go? Do not the fucking heat turn off? it down. Just just turn Jeez. it off for a minute. We can turn it back on. I'm already cutting glass here. We'll put on something rather than your thin ass silky sweater. Just just turn I'm, it to off. It's right there in the oh, the living room where I hang out. Talking about this, did they ever get a hold of you? No. Oh, I forgot about it now. They're not. I don't think so. What is it? Tactical distributors? No, it's no, not. This, no, this, this is some Alaskan it's really, hippie girl. Really cool shit. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Like f- All right, so Kevin, tell, some, tell some stories. Wearing a, having a goblet like that, you should probably be wearing this f- fur coat like a fucking Viking. I, I should, but you know. You right? should be wearing it like a Viking. But it's too hot in here. <clears throat> I do what I want. It's a pirate's life, Rad. Right? Would it be appropriate to tell Rad's anti poaching story? On the podcast. We well, already did. If you watched the podcast, you would know this. What the fuck, Andrew? You should have told me about that. <laughs> 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 All right. So there in the Eastern Cape, I'm so excited. Wait, wait. What? We did. You did tell it. But Rad didn't tell it. But, but, That's what I thought. Or did Thomas? you edit it out? No. You told the story. Rad didn't. I think, really? I think we got to hear it. Oh, I Rad should totally hear it. tell the story. <laughs> the crane group. Oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Did I not tell the story? Red, you might as well tell it because I mean, everybody's w- w- heard it anyway. We need to get organized here. Is this the thing we should go into? You're the boss. Well, I don't know that I'm He's right. He's terrible though. at making decisions. You should have done this. Well, I think you might as well tell it anyway, and you can edit it out if you yeah. want All right. To. Well, it's the, here's the thing. Whether Pet, you're in Canada or you're them. in Africa, and why free range is important to me, <clears throat> once you've hunted once or twice, is the adventure. Thomas, you had never hunted. James, I don't know if you ever had. You ladies had hunted none or very little. The adventure, the adventure of Africa being free range in those mountains, this is the wonderful part of hunting. It's not the animal. Yeah, I think as well, um, you know, over the years, hunting has changed. I mean, that we've been in the industry for quite a while now, and I've noticed the last four or five years, and I think probably our association with Q and the younger hunters coming into the industry is that the experience has become more important than the outcome. Yeah. So 10, 15 years ago, people would come with a hard and fast list. They'd want certain size animals. The record book was important. And now it's more about the experience. And yeah, yeah, the free range good. thing ties into that in that, you know, for me as a, as a guide or an outfitter, there's nothing worse than driving around a fence property knowing what you're going to see and what you're going to shoot. I think the adventure yeah, it's, and the, it's different than the unknown is what is the essence of hunting. And as soon as you take that unknown out of it, 
you're probably not really hunting anymore. I agree, because I, I hear you speak to your son, which Michael, who's seven. So we all go out every time I'm over, we take him hunting. And Rad PHs him. You and I try to assist somehow. And little Michael shoots animals, and it's wonderful. And I've heard you say to him a bunch of times, like, what's the difference in shooting and hunting? It, it, you know, and, and this is sort of what we're talking about. It, it's it, If people don't understand, anyone that gets into hunting, and I love it because even at this show in Dallas, 100 people came up to me and talked to me. They're like, I hadn't hunted since I was a child. I never hunted, but listening to your podcast, oh, look at Rad getting those. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jess. It's getting cold. Whole again. plate of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> it's getting cold again. But is <laughs> Rat, Rat just got so excited for those cookies. <laughs> I know. Did you see him almost jump out of his chair? They are delicious, though. No, I was, uh, you dropped your phone. Thank you, you, Jess. Jess is so domesticated. <clears throat> so, but but the hunting and and the adventure because. I mean, from my standpoint, which probably isn't average, but w- once you make some money, you make some dough, you can go shoot whatever big animal you want. And I can ride around a high fence and shoot it. But you're right. From a pH perspective, you're going to ride around in a big fenced area that's an 8, 10-foot fence where animals can't get out of, and you know what's in there. Where at your family ranch, at your ranch, it's, it's free range. The animals are just out there, and you never know what you're going to see. And to me, that's... That is so much more exciting. Like once you've shot a couple animals, that adventure when Rad and I, or well, I, I don't know, now that you're my PH, when we pull out in the morning and we're like, what do we want to do? And it's, well, we can, I mean, because we could ride for a month on your property and probably rarely see the same road twice. So there's so much land and it's like, well, let's see what we see. And to me, that's really the exciting part. And, and that's the part of hunting that's interesting to me. Like I don't care about, a, a giant trophy here to like show off to my friends. I mean, you see, like I've got one shoulder mount in this entire house and I've got some skull mounts over here. Like I like the skull mounts. It's cool, but I don't know. Anybody with some money can fly to Texas for the weekend and shoot a giant animal on a high fence. Like who cares? But animals that are in the wild and you hunt them that way and it's free range. You don't know what you're going to see. They're not captured with an offense. That is really exciting. And you're right, it's, it's a whole different experience. And so now we've shot so many animals, it's like I like going after broken horn and skewed horn stuff. Yeah. I think it, you know, as much as the, the experience is important, and, and, and that is you know, what I feel is coming back into hunting, the, if you're hunting animals where they're indigenous and where they've always been, yeah. they are generally going to be really good quality because that's their native habitat, it's where they've always been. Oh, like and they, the they, Nyala up in they're the not for, They're not forced to be there. So, you know, you want to hunt yeah. Nyala, you want to hunt them in Amkamas, KwaZulu Natal, that's where they come from. And, that, and, and that's the, and, the property you, you and Rad own where he, li- own yeah, where he lives. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we've done is we, we own a substantial amount of land in each of the conservancies and then lease a whole lot more. So as the hunter, you're not going to know where, whose land you're hunting on. You're hunting an area, not a property. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, it's a great experience. The trophy quality is cool. But you know, we, we've also been fortunate, I think, to over the last few years, um, you know, through our association and, and others in the industry to have a really nice clientele that want the same experience that we're offering. So it's worked well it's, together. It's cool. I think it's working well for you. I think you're right. Because your family traditionally, you guys do cattle and sheep, yeah? Yep. Like that entire valley is your family. And goats. No, Whatever I don't no, know, no, I don't know the difference. No goats, no <laughs> sheep. <laughs> the jackals and the leopard eat them too much. What's your brother doing? Yeah, they do. Um, they do a little bit of sheep, but it, it's becoming tougher and tougher to make a living like that. So I guess in and that's future, because cattle, of the baboon and the jackal and the yeah, predators, I mean, the you, you, yeah, you got to pay attention to small stock. So you know the the predators have become more and more over the years. Yeah, um, jackal. Hyena, caracal, leopard. So, I, f- I think in in a few years to come, probably cattle and game would be the only way forward, or the only way to make a yeah. to make a living. And you know, we touched on it earlier. So, you know, the the hunting such a a good way to make a return on on land that we you know we spend a lot of resources looking after. So, yeah, you have a huge staff. Well, if, if you look I at mean, 
at the property we we hunt us 300,000 acres we probably shoot a four or five hundred animals off there it's, it's maybe five percent of the total population of the animals and um you know when i look back 30 years when i grew up it was sheep cattle and goats and game had no no value but thanks to the you know the traveling hunter mainly american but all over the world they've created such a value that natural wildlife has become a more important resource in domestic livestock and you know we're probably 90 percent of the area was commercial ranch land 30 years ago yeah it's now i would say almost the reverse and that's only because of trophy hunting and the value placed on those animals yeah i, I think that's interesting i well one thing about that when you talked about indigenous population, it's, it's funny because when I came to your place the first time, there's fallow deer, and I was like, that's ridiculous. I don't care about shooting a fallow here because, you know, it's an antlered animal. It's not native to Africa. But when I found out the history in the area where you live and that your family brought them there, and now they flourish free range, that's an exciting hunt I look forward to every year now. And it's not indigenous there, but... Also, some of the other animals. I mean, in Yala, where Rad lives, or you know, Kudu, where where you are. Um, I don't know, but the idea that your family brought them there, brought them there, and now they're free range and they thrive, and it's wonderful. And I mean, I can always shoot a bigger fallow in New Zealand or in Texas in a high fence, but I mean, Rad and I, and he was PH of the year last year. You might get it this year. It right. was for four days you hunted with us, like four oh, oh. fucking days. And oh, he, I made a, I made a big, big impression. Big in four impression. Days, right? Big impression. Well, I'm pretty sure he irritated the shit out of him a couple of times as well. It's not true. He's he, talking. Shit. Was, Kevin he, irritated me, or yeah, that, the other that, way around. That, no, but we, uh, that way. Mm. We got on so well, that perfect, way. perfectly. Four but, days. I mean, we shot a monster. How big was that? We, we should put that uh, fellow up here right now. Um, but how big was that fellow last year? That was incredible. It was a stud. Where, oh. you, where did you guys shoot that fellow? Uh, at so, the, the back of your ranch. Sort of where you have uh, did your, your ball hole with the solar panels. Yeah. There. And that's where we double tapped. Waterback. No. Kudu. Kudu first. Boom. All right. So, so the kudu up and boom. then we smoked the fellow. Yeah. So, so one downside to the... Uh, Non high fence is you guys well not not in the Eastern Cape where you are because it's pretty remote, but uh, y'all's place in the Nkamas, uh North mm -hmm. is closer to a town, and you have to deal with uh, poachers. That's one thing about not having a gate and a big fence; they can just wander right onto your land with dogs, and yep. they poach animals to sell pieces to the Chinese or you've got, uh, to, have, you've got to have a good anti-poaching team up here yeah and a, and a good plan so speaking of the plan and anti-poaching team so Rad and uh, an ex-girlfriend of his mm -hmm. had an encounter mm -hmm. with a poacher and and I told the story previously you say Thomas but not with the color that Rad tells it mm, Rad can we hear this so what was going on? This is one of the, my favorite stories of all time. I was on the podcast last time. I'm sure you want to hear from Andrew. I can't More tell. than you want to hear from me. I can't tell that story like you mm -hmm. can. I wasn't there. I've just heard it. Mm. No one can tell it like Rad. My man. You, you had to have been there to tell the story. <laughs> do we have to do this now? <laughs> right yeah, now. If you don't like it, we'll edit it out. I mean, it's either that or the Petzl story. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> How about the condominium? <laughs> hey, we're putting oh, the best it, foot forward. Is yeah, that condo at the beach? Yeah, that's oh, a, that's yeah, a have great. Have you not heard the condominium that's story? That's a great add-on. Yeah, I did hear the condominium story. Red, we, we, we're talking yeah. about hunting and anti-poaching as keep it tidy. <laughs> it's not no more tidy than the condominium, but okay. The suspense is killing. Julia, I apologize. The, the condo at the the beach. Do you ladies know condo at the beach? No, it wasn't condo at the beach. No, no, I, I have a condo at the beach story. Yes, I'll tell you. Yeah. So it's um, so so a girl that I used to see. <laughs> you know her, we can edit all this out. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Her, but please can so, we just send this clip to Julia when I say condominium. I'd prefer this was laugh. Why don't you tell the story wait, and then we can say condo at the beach. Kevin's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> wait, condo at the beach. You know what that is? No. You're trying to get like brownie points with Julia or what? No, condo at the beach. Okay, that's what that's what you, an ex of mine and their friends called butt sex, and it was like because you don't go that often, but when you do, it's a good time. Oh boy! 
I, I learned let's, it from some women. That's all I'm saying. Let's let's get let's hear the all right. Let's, let's hear, hear the, the poaching let's hear story. The poaching story. Whatever toaster, we got this. Yeah, the poaching story has a lot of relevance to what we do. So, I mean, our areas, particularly in Natal, because they're not fenced, you're faced with day-to-day problems that are African issues that we yeah. deal with. And, well, and, uh, well I know. think that what people don't understand that have never been there, that that's in an area where they don't need to do it for food. They do no. it to sell the animal or to sell pieces of the animal, yep. not to feed their families. So to give because you, to me, if I own your land and there's a village nearby and they're starving, and you got a 13 year old boy that needs to kill a wildebeest, to, you know, so they can survive. Fine. Yep. But that's that's not what this mm-hmm. is. So I mean, to give you some context, most of the meat of the animals that are hunted gets donated to influential people in the community, the surrounding communities. We support a school. So the poaching is is commercial poaching rather than subsistence poaching. Yes, yeah, subsistence poaching is is a different story, and yeah. you know you can condone that to some po- to some point. Although you know you own the animal, so it's effectively stealing, but it's more understandable. Yeah, it's it's different in America, you know, because in America, like the state owned the whitetail yeah. and stuff. So, so the views in South Africa, the the animals belong to the owner of that land. In our areas. They move freely between different landowners. So when there's poaching, it, it's effectively stealing. Oh, oh that's the ice maker. <laughs> I, thought a, I thought it was a fucking drone. <laughs> that thing is absolutely shitting off to make ice. It's, <laughs> it's in a fucking panic. It sounds yeah. like well, sounds like Rad's cruiser when Kevin drives. <laughs> well, okay, so back up? to poaching. Uh, but people don't understand. Well, here it's like, oh, you know, when I'll, I'll post a picture of something that we hunt, when Rad and I hunt the leopard or lion or something like that, it's like, oh, it's endangered. So, like, ignorant Americans think everything is fucking endangered in Africa. And, <clears throat> and what they don't understand, which I say on the podcast all the time, is there would be no animals in Africa except ones that were imported, like goats or cattle or sheep, if it weren't for hunters. That's where the That's conservation right. does not come from these green organizations. Conservation 100% comes from hunting and, and hunters. Yeah, putting and one... All the anti-poaching stuff. I mean, that, that's 100% correct. So, I mean, if you've got a piece of land, there, there's very few people that buy a piece of land that can afford to just let it sit there and not get some sort of a return on it. So, you know, you've got options. You're either going to have cattle or if you've got water, you could do some kind of agriculture or you can do what we do and, and rehabilitate that land and try and restore it to what it was like you know, hundreds of years ago, and as much as we hunt and have... Oh, wait, and what do you mean hunted, by that? You know, try and bring the the areas that we hunt and then the properties that we own back to what they were before there was cattle ranching and agriculture. Oh, so clearing the land for cattle or... Yeah, so, like I mean, if you look at, at the Amkamas, for example, we've got a, a big piece of land there, and, you know, we were fortunate to be able to be in a position to buy it but that land has to bring a return and uh you know we do that through very selective trophy hunting and and we are fortunate enough to sell those animals at a premium and you know run a a sustainable business and you know it's rewarding to look back every every year and say that through hunting you've made improvements to that land yeah because that's allowed you guys to do Pecans, as you would say, we would yep. say pecans here in America. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and look at our look at our blue blue daca operation. Oh, that's we've cool, got a yeah. book there that they um, I can't remember who who wrote it, but it tells you what what the indigenous an- animals were in that area. Yeah, and I mean at the top of uh, one of our property, well, the one property in them Kamas is an elephant wallow. Yeah. And it goes back to, I mean, there were elephant there, there were buffalo there, there were all of that. Well, just like and in the Eastern Cape, like ne- next uh, Andrew's dad's place, Buffalo's so Clough, Street, Buffalo's yeah. Clough. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that means Buffalo's, yeah, Cliffs, Buffalo right? Valley, yeah, yeah, Buffalo, Buffalo Valley. Valley. So then, I mean, where we are, back in the day, they all spoke about the high racks and the blue darker being around, and for a long time we hadn't seen blue darker, and you know, a few years ago. In a couple spots, we saw blue darker, 
And then Andrew, you know, after COVID and a little bit of a slight recovery, we got an opportunity and we've got a little Blue Darker project going where we want to get our Blue Darker numbers back up and running. So it's in the Inkamas too. Yeah. Because there's, there's the Blue Diker pen in my front yard. So no. you brought some in there trying to breed them so yeah, you can release them there as well for free range. We've got 10, yep. 10 pairs of Blue Diker. We've had a couple of learning curves there. Um, but we've got that back up and running, and that's not something new. They are indigenous to the yeah. area, and whether they died out, no one really can explain whether that was disease or predator, and I think it was a combination of both. Yeah. Disease and predator. <coughs> or Car- hunting. Carical, yeah. which carical will, were never there. Some retard introduced them. Oh, we can't, we they, can't say retard. It's uh, American. Some can't. special person. No, we're, we're going to say... Special needs. Some fucking idiot <laughs> <That's> introduced... <better. laughs> Garical, <laughs> and that's how we ended up, and that that I has mean, been part of the problem. You, on, you guys know from Canada. I mean, we're kind of in the same situation in the part of the U.S. that touches over there. You know, in Montana and Yellowstone, they introduced the wolves, and now like, the elk population has taken a dump. Oh, fucking real, <laughs> real Einstein's. Yeah, you, 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 you got to manage those populations. People don't understand. Like we talked about talked about in the podcast before when you and I hunt in Mozambique, the elephants, where you see hundreds of acres that used to be you know like canopy now there's no trees it looks like a giant tornado went through there the hand of god and broke every tree the elephants destroy that and it destroys habitats for all the other animals and that's only because we you know we there's a there's a fence and there's restricting the movement and the canopy situation kruger and stuff kruger and, and mozambique but that's also because you know people who don't understand what's going on wouldn't let them cull elephants. If it was up to Kruger, they would have culled elephants a long time ago and yeah. kept the, the population at you know the right level and that situation wouldn't have taken place. But yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting and I, I think just you know, as an American and growing up and learning about the rest of the world, like none of this is taught. Like you don't understand, you know, conservation. It's not, not the narrative. Well what's um all right, so the poacher store. Oh fuck. So <laughs> <laughs> so you're hanging out, you and Thomas <laughs> hanging out with a couple chicks, and then Kamas, and then what happens? Oh uh, boy, how descriptive do I have to be with this whole thing? Absolutely every fucking wrinkle and detail. Okay, I'm not going to show you photographs, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's post the photographs. I <laughs> no, I took those for evidence just in case. Um. So, my parents and some friends were, and family friends were down at the camp where uh, Andrew's camp in Namkamas, and I was at home, which is also Namkamas. So, cruising down and uh, get to this old bridge. <clears throat> Used to be the, the, old, the old main road. Um, so, I get, get there and I'm cruising. I'm on the other side of the bridge and I look across the other side, and there's someone sitting there. So I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? So I drive across and I stop the cruiser and I look out the window and old Kippy's parking there and he's like looks looks up at me and I ask him, you know, what are you doing here? And he reckons Where are you going? I don't know, he's gonna hand hand it's distracting me. Just take the beer and open it like a reasonable person. Jesus man. Sorry about that, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So you're like, yo, my man, what are you doing? So I check this guy sitting there. I'm like, hey. And this, this is on you know, his private property. Yeah, on our private property, signed. We've got signboards, everything. Everything's all there, fences. Well, four-foot cattle fence. But, I mean, if you're crossing Bob wire, you know it's like there's a fucking problem, right? Yeah. So I ask him, what are you doing here? No, I said to him, hey, what's up? And he goes, no, he's feeling sick. And uh, the taxi dropped him off on the side of the road. There's, no, there's fucking nowhere to pull over. Yeah, uh, uh, I've been You've there. Been up like that the road. driveway is in the or a and big dangerous turn. Right? The paved road <laughs> going up. Yeah. There's nowhere to just to pull over. So he reckons no. He was feeling sick, so he needed to go to the river to get a get a drink of water. Mind you, it's in December. It's been pissing with rain, and the river is like chocolate. It's fucking brown. So I'm thinking, no, fuck. 
you could have been dropped off at the turn off to Pateni. And if you wanted to drink shitty brown river water, you could have done it there. And I see he's trying to hide something in between his legs. And I see there's a, there's a strap, like a backpack strap. And I said, what's in the backpack? As I said that, he got up, ran down the bank, under the bridge. More dipshit ran further into our property. So he ran further into the farm. So, you know, I was tired of this shit. So I said, no, fuck it. I didn't have Simon at this stage, uh, our anti-poaching oak. Yeah. So Simon's good. Just watch your car keys. Yeah. Jumped out the car. I ran down the bank, ran under the bridge. And then because we had so much rain, like all the... Uh... Pring, why don't you top us up there? Okay, I'll just drink yours. So ran down and he ran into like... Would say the middle maniki, um, halfway across the river where you know when all the like you get a big flood and all the grass and shit wraps around the pylons and the bridge mm. makes like a little island. Yeah, so yeah. he ran into that. He lost a flip flop on the way there. <laughs> so now he's fucking. He's got one. He's pedaling with one. So I said stop, come here, and he didn't want to. So I ran onto the middle island. He ran across. He ran down the bank, and he starts hooking it down the bank. So I'm like, fucking, I'm angry. Oak's making me run. So I ran after him. And it was like... Would, would you threaten him? Why did he run from you? Because I asked him what was in the backpack. And instead of just saying nothing, he just like st- stood up and took off. So fucking automatically he's guilty. You ran away from me on my property when I questioned him. And he starts hauling ass. You, you're guilty. And I, I agree. I yeah. agree with you. So it's like a floodplain. Thomas, plane. you engaged here? You got it. It's a floodplain. And then like a little... No, three, four foot bank that climbs up. So I eventually catch up with him. As he climbs up the bank, I fucking tackle him. Bah! No, no, we go down. Is this guy your size? No, he's a little smaller than me. He's like Thomas's size. But he's a wiry little fucker. He's just like bloody ribs and cock and balls and sinew. He's just, <laughs> just, just, just all muscle. So he's up for a fight. Oh, no, he's a scrappy little bastard. So we're into it. We're tussling and like just watching his hands, making sure they don't go anywhere. Got them. Got them on the ground. We're tussling. Grabs a stick, tries to stab me with a stick. So I fucking grab a stick. And I'm just like pushing everything away to make sure there's no rocks or loose sticks or anything you can like, I'm thinking. Hurt you, know. you with. Yeah, yeah, hurt me with. Exactly. So old mate is not exactly keen to give up Yeah, He just keeps going. I'm a lot stronger than him. Frick, I just got stamina. He FC took some of them, them blue chew <laughs> things there because he's fucking going. He wasn't a one and done type of. <laughs> so he's giving it horns and I'm just, fuck, I'm getting tired. I'm getting irritated now. Well, so, wait, what, what's your suspicion? He goes, uh, I don't know, poaching, 100% poaching. Like yeah. guilty, you know. No, the reason to be. No, on that I don't property. know if he was putting. I don't, at the time, I didn't know if he was putting snares or if he had a handgun or if he had a rifle hidden somewhere or or what he was doing. But yeah. he was guilty of yeah. something. So he's got his backpack and he's terrified to let it go. And I quickly figured that out when we start tussling. So eventually, gets his backpack away from him and I toss it to the side. And we're going. I'm just keeping his hands busy, just making sure that. Mm. So we're having a full go. And uh, my girlfriend at the time um, comes down. <laughs> <laughs> new girlfriend. No. Yeah, she at, was, yeah, she at was the new, time. Yeah, she was new at the time. Mm. Yes. So, so she, she honey, was in the car. So, so she, she was in the car on the bridge. On honey the bridge. face. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so she, what the fuck's that got to do with the story? So <laughs> she was trying to impress oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So she's on the bridge. She comes running down. She runs up and she's got my handgun and my Leatherman. And I'm like, what the fuck's the Leatherman for? But I actually remember thinking and looking up and she's got the handgun and the Leatherman. Like, gun good, Leatherman, like, question mark. What, what are I we don't know. Anyway. Pull a fingernail, get some answers. Something, yeah. <laughs> well, fuck if I... Anyway, so... She, we, hey, she's trying to be helpful. So, Monster. anyway. Cheers to her. Get everything. Trying to help yeah, you. Yeah, no, listen, she... she Thought outside the box there, that's for sure, especially with the Leatherman. But <laughs> so anyway, get there. We're having a full tussle. Pull the handgun out. I'm thinking, no, no, what am I gonna do with this whole thing? 
So um, I decide uh, not to use the handgun. Because um, <laughs> he's not getting the best may, of you I, at I the time. may have uh, intimidated him a little bit, but then decide to send the uh, handgun and the Leatherman back because I've cleared the area. Um, of all sticks and stones and the sticks that he tried to stab me with and all everything. And I've kind of asked him very nicely without hurting him at all at this stage. It's just been a wrestling match. Asked him very nicely just to calm down and just listen to me and he's not going to get away. So I send the, the handgun and the leatherman back to the vehicle and ask for the cable ties. And you guys call them zip ties. Zip ties, yeah. Behind my seat where I'm driving, I've got two zip t- two packets of zip ties. Yeah, yeah. One's as thick as this. Vape, and the other one is this little scrawny, tiny, little thin, thin ones for like yeah. cable and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, during the whole process between the handgun going back and the zip ties coming, I'm standing above the guy, and he's on the ground now. He's kind of tired because he's been resting for a while, and uh, it's hot. It's summer. It's December. It's the Umkamas, it's hot, yeah, it's humid. So southern Hemisphere. Yeah, opposite. Southern Hemisphere. So it's like July here in yeah, America. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hot, humid, it's like July in fucking Arizona. Mm. No, more like Florida. Yeah. So a little bit of humidity. I'm wearing my shorts. Commando. Yeah, I didn't didn't have any battle briefs or anything. Fuck, you actually need to put like little pouches in these things. But anyway, so I'm standing there, no battle briefs, just my trousers, my shorts. Trousers. Shorts. And I've been to South Africa, so these are probably short shorts. No, no, I'm not a bonehead. I mean, they're just above my knees, all right? So I'm standing there telling the guy, giving him a lecture, please just stop your shit, just calm down. I'm standing above him now. Right? He's looking. So he's lying down. He's lying down on his back on the ground. He's got his hands like this. You know, he's parking like so. And I'm above him, looking down on him. And I'm just like, right, mate, just. You're not going to win this. You're not going to get away. Well, before I can think, blink, shit, turn on the lights, he fucking shoots up like a puff adder. <laughs> Sticks his fucking right hand. <laughs> puff adder's like a rattlesnake. Straight <laughs> up my fucking pants. He obviously is parking there, checked all twig and berries, parking there like a baby <laughs> pigeon. He's just like, ha, ha, none so. Little twig and berries. Ah, shit, you know, the old baby pigeon's parking in the nest there. <laughs> he shoots his hand straight up my fucking pants. <laughs> And he grabs my nuts. <laughs> I'm officially, for the first time in my life, being molested by a man. He has got them cradling in the palm of his fucking hand. Right there. Yeah. The plums. The pl- yeah, the baby pigeon. He's pocket. Oak on the top was okay. But oak, on the, oak on the bottom, the, the two members on the bottom of the board meeting were not happy. So he has um, the berries. In the palm of his hand, literally, <laughs> skin to skin. I mean, that's just <laughs> thank fuck. Did you get hard? Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got my balls cradled in the palm of his hand, but thank fuck he had the crane grip. <laughs> so the crane grip. Like, this is the crane grip, like so. You know, when you're a light and you first start playing, you you, you didn't you don't really have that action yet. It's a little. It, She's got the crane nope. grip. Don't know that one. And uh, if he had had them like this, I was fucked. Yeah. He, <laughs> if he, he had is, had, if he, he had vice grip, crushed them. If vice he had vice grip, grip we were done. Mm. But he had crane grip. And yeah, uh, you, I mean, there's only what, so much you can do. There. There's only so much pressure you can do. There's not very really strong grip. But anyway, he had him like that, and uh, so I latched on. And I grabbed his wrist. <laughs> And my hydraulic suspension gave way immediately. <laughs> I crumbled at the knees. And it, like I said, it was hot, so there was humidity and there were both being natural lubricants. So I managed to fucking and the crane grip detach it. The crane grip gave way. <laughs> Have you seen that video? Those little like gifs or gifs or whatever you call them. And uh is is that one where the is the guy look says like to someone, uh, it was at this moment he realized he fucked up. <laughs> it was that one. Because when I managed to get his hand off. Oh, you had to be terrified. He you, looked, ha- you had he, to be terrified, right? Like a dude's got a hold of your balls. No, I felt violated. 
It was terrible. Oh, I would have been terrified. No, it was it was not nice. But when I <laughs> managed to r- rip his hand off, his eyes just fucking lit up like this. And the chap looked up at me and realized he had made a grave mistake. <laughs> so he sat up to say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And as he sat up to Tolisa, he got met by a right arm round and I clapped the shit out of him. I hit him on the left ear and he fucking went dizzy. <laughs> so as he sat up to say sorry, I said, no thanks. Bah! <laughs> fucking right <like> that. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking felt very dizzy. He thought, mate, he'll try a second time just in case I didn't hear him the first time. And he sat up again and he got met by the same response. <laughs> so then we had a... Yeah. So rude. Yeah, he shouldn't have asked twice. He should have just realized he'd fucked up and just taken a beating. But he had manhandled me. At this stage, Literally. all bets were off. It was just like, that's it. So he got a couple over the left ear, which if you know anything about that, if you cup someone over an ear, you compress that air down to his eardrum, which then is the same as seasickness, which Andrew will know about. It fucks with your equilibrium. So you, <laughs> your balance is not on point. So I gave mate a couple over the ear. He stood up. And I said, oh, he, after that, he said, okay, I'll come with you. All right, at this point, my ex had come back with the cable ties. She didn't bring the thick ones. She bought the little thin ones. So I tried cable tying his hands. And every time I did that, he kept popping them. And I was so angry at this stage, I didn't think about just cable tying his thumbs together, which he would never have popped. But So anyway, I got him to stand up, and we were on the way back to the vehicle, straight line, and equilibrium was not quite right. So he started wobbling off to the side, and he <laughs> fucking started wobbling, got a bit of momentum, and momentum carried on, and he thought he could get away. And he went running, slapping into a tax canter bush. Taxacantha <laughs> is like cat claw. I mean, it just hooks like so. So like a, everything in Africa has claws and briars and sticks you, and so these are yeah hooks, so you, you really can't get out very easily. So he thought he would get away, and he ran into one of these bushes, <laughs> and his momentum wasn't quite there. He hadn't hit warp speed yet, <laughs> and he got stuck. <laughs> And I was like, well, <laughs> I've given you a chance and uh, you grabbed my balls, you violated me, sexually harassed me, molested me and everything. That's an assault. It, yeah, an assault. I and, learned that uh, too. So he kind of got stuck in this tax can't the bush. So I just, I'm fucking over this shit. <laughs> it's Christmas. I've had my balls grabbed, <laughs> scratched. It's hot. It's sweaty. So those, that's the photo evidence is the... Uh, oh, yeah, scratch, the uh, ball, uh, scratches on my ball, my ball bag, yeah. <laughs> so we showed the cops. <laughs> no, well, I have, if I had to, I would have. But uh. So he got stuck in this bush. So I just thought, no, fuck it. So I ran and I just did one running fucking fly kick there and I just stood up and I just got horizontal. So that's like a just drop kicked, kick. <laughs> kicked him straight through the fucking tax can that was whack up. Thomas, right now, can we insert a uh, road warrior hawk drop kick <laughs> right here? Both no? feet though, eh? Both feet. Oh, yeah, it's a drop kick. So it's he, both. he oh. went through, I landed on the ground. There's a bit of clothing left on the couple thorns there and Yeah. And then that was the end of it. Then he took off and he was fucked. And I was just like, I'm over this dude. Phoned the cops, told them what happened, been sexually abused, <laughs> molested, assaulted, everything. <laughs> Got the evidence to prove it. Um, believe it or not, the guy that molested me and the guy that I fly kicked through the bush and clapped went to the cop station. They knew he, who he was talking about, phoned me to say, hey, the guy that you phoned us about is here. He doesn't want to press charges. He doesn't want to press charges. All he wants is his backpack back. So that's right. His, he, all he wanted was his backpack back from me, which I had. So I just said, well, fuck you. <laughs> I'm not going to get it. What's in his backpack? <clears throat> his backpack had uh, some like little parts of African like medicine which Dr. Voodoo shit, snuff, and a few other this and that. There was some 22 Magnum 
Ansem 22, um, just standard long rifle. Yeah. Ammo, a license card, cell phone. Yeah, one or two other things in there. Say so ever come back and uh, kick your ass? No, 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 no. I think uh, that was the last I ever saw of him. <laughs> Still got his backpack and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do it's something in, with it's that. It's in uh, Umklatin, PTY, lost and found. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. So we're back. A little break, a little dinner, a little snacks, a little shit talk. Um, <laughs> Andrew. Kevin. Oh, you finished your whiskey. You, you want some more? <laughs> Red finished it, but I have some more. All right. So, what's your favorite animal to hunt there in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, the free range hunting situation? <laughs> Push back. <clears throat> All right, Red, we'll get to you, sister. Yeah, yeah. Stay in your lane, Redcliffe. Um, Kevin, I like all the spiral horns. So, kudu, kudu and bushbuck in the Eastern Cape. And there's a special little animal down there called a vile rebuck. Oh. Which you shot about twenty five of, so <laughs> you're probably better place than me to talk about Val Rebuck. But they endemic to those hills of the eastern side of South Africa, and they they pretty tough to hunt. So they they a good challenge. And then Kudu and Bushbuck, um, Eland are, are cool. Um, and then throwing Nyala up in the Amkamas. So those are. Yeah, I mean, those are, are my favourites. But I mean, I live there and and we hunt them all the time. So I know. You know, seven, eight, nine, ten day safari. You really want a combination of spiral horns and then some of the plains animals that are huntable all day. So, but personally, I would say if you had to push me for one animal, I would say big kudu. Yeah, there's got to be a reason it's everyone's favorite. Yeah, big kudu are awesome. What? Um, what's your favorite hunt ever, other than all the ones with me? Yeah, early December. Was your favorite time to hunt? <laughs> hunting with you. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. They, I mean, there've been so many. Um, well, what, for the last couple of years, we've had some some good weeks of hunting. So, unfortunately, I don't hunt in the field as much anymore. I mean, I've taken over as your main PH now, which is fun and <laughs> it's a privilege. I agree. But, you know, looking back over the years of hunting, I mean, probably the times you sort of look back on are the, the weeks like we had in December where I don't think anyone went to bed other than me before 3 a.m. And there was a lot of fun. There was no competition. Everyone sort of shared in the experiences together. So, I mean, you always remember the those exceptional animals that you hunt and, you know, some of the hunts that you have with especially kids and first time hunters, you know, that's yeah. always rewarding. Yeah. But then more than that, probably just the fun times you have with good groups of hunters. I agree with that. It's the experience. The from a hunting standpoint, I love yeah. I mean the the highlight of every trip I have to South Africa it is when the three of us take your your son hunting. Like that's a great time. Or when we go out and it's not what we're just a surprise happens the adventure all of a sudden there's a giant kudu with a skewed horn and he's you know 900 meters and we've got to you know make a plan to get to him within range and you know make a good shot and like all those times i mean that you're not expecting you know a jackal runs out in front of the truck and we got to get after it uh yeah those are the good times to yep. me yeah. well i think that's the beauty of hunting in africa where you never really know what to expect, and and anything's possible at any at any time. So yeah, you know, it, it, it's not a one animal hunt. It's you know you keep your options open, and if you go into it open minded with without a set agenda of what exactly you want to shoot, that's normally when you have the best time and don't miss opportunities. You know, around every corner is something different. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, and it, it's because that's the beauty to me is we can go drive around for a day and see hundreds and hundreds of animals. And, you know, and, and some days you don't shoot anything, but often you can. And it's just the adventure and the unexpected part where you don't know what's going to happen. Because, you know, it's different than, like, uh, whatever, a whitetail hunt in Canada or an elk hunt out west. You're going to go spend a couple weeks. You've got 
a chance at one animal. Maybe you get it, maybe you don't. But, you know, if you go to Africa, like if we went to your place to shoot a, a Cape buffalo, maybe maybe we get lucky we get it done in a couple of days. Mm. And you're there for a week or two. Well, oh, my God. Then there's impala, warthog, you know, and yala, kudu. There's all these <clears> animals, <throat> and it's not... You know, you can hunt a lot of African animals in Texas, and it's it's hunting, but it's high fence, and it's expensive. But, you know, plains game hunting in, in most of South Africa is very affordable. And, and so you can spend another week or so shooting animals, and it's not going to cost you another $15,000. You can go on a hunt in Africa and spend two weeks and shoot 10 animals, and it's less than a good elk hunt in America. I think so. I think, you know, there's also something for everybody. So not not everyone has the same objective when they go there. Some some guys just go for fun, and I'll sort of easy going and take it as it comes, and, and that's great, and others will – maybe narrow it down and say, look, I've been to Africa a number of times and I've experienced different areas. I want to come there and I want to shoot these animals, but I want to spend time looking for the biggest ones possible. And, you know, to do that, you've got to go to areas where there is that opportunity to do it. You know, in our areas, we can't guarantee anything to anybody. And I think that's the beauty of hunting free range areas is that the big animals are there. And everybody's got an equal chance. So yeah. no matter who you are or where you come from, you've got an equal chance of getting that once in a lifetime animal. Yeah, and, and you guys have educated me on not chasing the inches, but the experience. And you know, you have world class animals in these areas and it's free range. But you know, for me if it's if if I go every two or three months and spend time, what are we gonna do? Now we're gonna you know, like a fifty inch Cape Kudu is a big kudu. So we're going to like chase 51 inch. Like, I don't know. It seems lame. So it, it's it's like for me now that I've shot some good animals, the broken horn, the skewed horns, you have so much property. There's always something to hunt that's an adventure. Like we want to set out, you know, like your, your ranch hands that, that you know, um, mend and keep the fences up and stuff for the cattle. They're out there all the time. They're always seeing stuff. So there's always a broken horn or a skewed horn something in an area where we can go try to find it and hunt, and that's exciting. Radcliffe, what what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Thomas said I was <clears throat> breathing into the mic too heavily. <laughs> <laughs> so had to. It was. He's sitting there just... <laughs> <laughs> It what? might have been Andrew. <laughs> Don't blame me. That's your Probably default setting. Me after five fucking cookies. Jesus Christ. What was I thinking? What, um, Red, what's your favorite thing to hunt in South Africa? Uh, in the conservancies. Bushbuck. Always enjoy a bushbuck. A big pig. Yeah. And fellow. No, yeah. fellow. Fellow. That's left field. That's what I'm woke, but. <laughs> I, I think Rad and I got turned on to it a couple of years ago when JJ started talking shit. I've always liked them during the rut and whatnot. It's just, it's just, it's fun. I know it's different. It's something that is not endemic, but it's been there for 200 and something years. So, yeah, it's cool. And it's cool. Just like um, elk or axis. I mean, fallow the rut's a good time the communication the chasing yeah i love fallow it's delicious you oh, said that so. uh you said that you saw some some young ones that are, might be big Ooh. soon Ooh. well they've had a a, a drought in uh, the eastern cape where andrew is for a long time they had a couple of years of a lot of rain and oh the food source i mean every animal is fat Every animal now looks like it's raised in a pen or a high mm. fence. They're all fat. There's so much food, nutrients. Yeah, and so Andrew and I were hunting, and uh, Andrew jumped, what, 14 fallow stag that are still together because it's not the rut, and their their horns are in velvet or their antlers are in velvet and half-grown. It's going to be a phenomenal year for uh, fallow hunting. Oh, End of March, early April. Going to be a good time. Yeah, it's going to be great. Red is, um, but overall in Africa, buffalo your favorite to hunt. Elephant, what's your favorite? Uh, <clears throat> I think buffalo is always there's always something different going on with the buffalo. Yeah, so it can be close, can be 
you know, it's, it's always a different scenario. Um, so I'd say Buffalo overall is a, a staple, exciting hunt, yeah. regardless. Cats are nice because you, you're trying to outsmart them. So a little bit of sort of brain power when it comes to that. Yeah, that's a challenging hunt. It, I, it I is, was, it we is. were at Dallas and I was walking around with Kristen, who's hunted with you guys a couple of times and who I met at y'all's place. And she was asking me about uh, cat hunting when we were walking around in, in Dallas. And to me, it's such a challenging hunt now that I've done it a couple of times. And the interesting part of it, like I think sheep hunting, like physically demanding and then mentally is probably, I haven't done it, but is a very difficult hunt. But cat hunting to me is is difficult in the sense that you can spend two weeks driving around baiting. You just get so mind fucked that if the cats aren't staying on bait, you're not finding a mature cat, you know, and, and time's going on. And it's, it's a difficult hunt having to hang bait, shoot animals to hang bait every day, check the cameras. You know, it's draining. And then you just have that moment where the cat's on bait and you get to go do it. And cats are just, I mean, it's probably, I guess, buck fever for everyone when there's a 500 pound lion 50 yards from you or you know seeing a leopard for the first time in the wild how you and i were just in mozambique and and uh hunting in a in a new area hadn't been hunted before and we got a lot of leopard on bait there's a lot of leopard in the area but the first time i saw a, a leopard well i mean i'd seen a couple like run at distance or whatever in the wild but where we we set up a blind we had one on bait and you check you're checking the cameras and it looks like a good one but you got to see it in person and it walked out what like 10 yards in front of us just right in front of the blind and you couldn't hear a thing like they are so stealth and just oh such a cool animal and can jump you know just leap 40 feet up a tree and you never hear a thing and yeah it's, it's such a cool hunt uh to try to outsmart a cat yeah, that's the thing with the cat is it's it's trying to outsmart them, and it's not it's not personal until that last when you're sitting in the blind or whereas you know hunting a buffalo or an elephant in terms of dangerous game is a lot more personal. You know, an elephant you're tracking, you're getting up to it, but you know we've done a whole pile of buffalo from the Eastern Cape to Mozambique. It doesn't matter where you hunt them, it's still freaking exciting you're getting close you're getting into that zone where it's no longer comfortable for anyone uh, yeah it, it is exciting i mean that that should be an aspirational hunt in my opinion for everyone like hunting buffalo you don't i mean without going and doing you can't understand like being an american we see like cattle you know all the time bulls and maybe they don't look that different but um yeah, i mean you and i andrew at your place had some experiences with buffalo here the last hunt in December, where it's a herd of 40 or 50, and we got dangerously close a couple of times. And, you know, buffalo just aggressive and stand their ground at some point. And it's always interesting to me, like, they look at you like they want to fuck you up. They act like they want to <laughs> fuck you up. And, I mean, they, they're just way more intimidating. I mean, I think naturally the small part of our brains, we're afraid of cats. Or, you know, the baboons, you know, primates in general are, are pretty scary. But buffalo, it's like a whole nother thing. They just like, I mean, you can tell they want to kill you. And then it's the one animal where you hunt really close. Like you're 20 yards, 10 yards, 30 yards. It's so close. It can cover that ground instantly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that I'll ever get sick of hunting buffalo. The last, the last one that we um, hunted... In, in Mozambique with the eight six, where they were in that uh, that that flay or that meadow, and they went into the yeah. tall grass, and we tried to flank them, and they got onto us. They got our wind or whatever, and all came out. And there's what like ten, fifteen, twenty. Yeah, about twenty buffalo, and we thought there were like five or six. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we thought there just a few because <clears> the <throat> rest were in this this thick grass, and we tried to flank them, come around, and they all came out and just faced us. It was like a standoff, like we we're gonna have a gang fight, and then. <laughs> Then it was so exciting because we saw, we knew there were some mature bulls, but then, you know, we, the big ones were already in the tall grass. So when they came out, it was, I mean, we saw the one that I shot. Everyone knew that's the one to shoot. It was the most mature, the oldest one, the biggest one. And then it's exciting, you know, you shoot it and they run directly into the bush and you got to go after it and make sure that it's, 
you know, it's dead or you got to finish it off and it's scary being close to it. And, whew. I mean, you know, you look at it, it's, it's, the one, it's the one animal that no matter where you're hunting it, no one gets sick of hunting it. You know, a lot of guys will do one lion, do one leopard, <clears throat> maybe two leopard and a lion, and they, they sort of get over the cat hunting part of things. But you never hear of anyone, well, I don't know of anyone that gets tired of, of hunting buffalo. You know, it's it's the one dangerous game animal that, whether you're in the Eastern Cape or Natal, where you did your the subsonic, or yeah. you know, what what do you think of this subsonic? So I've told the, I think I've told the story on the pod. Yeah, I told the story on the podcast for the video should be out here pretty soon. I was going to ask. Um, I was editing that footage uh, from that hunt that you're talking about um, recently, and I noticed how cautious you are, even though it's lying dead in the bush. You're like, has it has it ever like looked dead and popped up on you has that ever happened because you seem like the way that your body language is because it's right on you as you're approaching it you it's it's like you've seen a thing or two before or are you just like are you just innately cautious about it it's always the dead ones that fuck you up Damn. yeah it's kind of the same th- saying with unloaded firearms it's the ones that shoot everyone accidentally um well, if you remember, it was just a day or two before we shot that buffalo where someone's tracker was killed or almost killed by a buffalo that was wounded and they thought were dead. Yeah, that's right. He, he unfortunately did end up passing on. No, he did. Very sad story. Well, I think that's, I mean, there, there's always that inherent danger with, with buffalo and that, that's what fuels that addiction to hunting them, you know. And I think so. In your case, you, you know, you've challenged yourself with, with the the firearms that you've used. So a lot of the time you've, you've been really close. I mean, you've shot them with eight, six or subsonic. And I mean, if you do your job properly and you look in that case, it ran 25 yards and, and that, that was the end of the Buffalo and yeah. you've shot them a supersonic as well. And, and in all those different scenarios, you've had to get into a position where it, one mistake can lead to a pretty bad outcome because you're close. Yeah, but I mean, it, fortunately, it, you know, good shots, good firearms, good ammunition have have meant that there haven't been any issues. But it, there, there is always that danger when you're hunting them. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be the adrenaline, it's the excitement of it. I mean, that that's why it's fun. Like, I never get tired of hunting kudu, and even if we shoot them at five or six hundred yards, it's it's an incredible hunt. But the buffalo situation is different. Like, I have no interest in shooting a buffalo at 200 yards. Like, Well, if you want to do that, you might as well go to South Texas and shoot a black Angus. <laughs> yeah, I so. think. But but getting close to where, you know, uh, I mean, that last hunt that you and I did in, in Mose or when you and I were uh, up on top of the mountains at your place, and when you're close enough to where y- y- you, you see, you know, the steam coming out of their nose and you hear them breathe. Mm. And, uh, Smell them. Uh, Oh yeah, that that's the fun part of that. Well, part. I mean, you look you look at all the buffalo we've done together. The one we did at at Mo's place with the subsonic. Yeah, that was the furthest we've shot a buffalo. Yeah, 50, with this, it was like forty nine yards or something. Yeah, with the subsonic. With the subsonic maybe. was the was the furthest was incredible. shot we've we've taken yeah. on the buffalo. Everything else has been. Sort of thirty yards and under, yeah, thirty-five yeah. yards and under. I mean, yeah, that's you the don't forget by far. the buffalo hunt to had with Thomas, and that was at about, <laughs> at about six yards. <laughs> yeah, that that was. That, I mean, that was so interesting. Now, I would I would love the repeat of that. I would be far more excited because now I know that was abnormal. Yeah, jeez, um, luck. Yep. But you know, it's another thing. It was cool about the fix. You know, ha- have ten rounds. You know, I've got a lightweight gun that's short and I can maneuver. Like seeing someone y'all size or Grant when we were in Moe's, you know, we were going after that buffalo when he r- ran in the bush and then laid down. And, uh, you know, we're walking through the bush and, and they're carrying, you know, guns like this over their shoulder in traditional style. And every time one of you big guys bend over, that your, your gun's catching on tree limbs and stuff like that. It's just, it's just not the right thing for that type of hunting. Well, if we had the proper fix, we would be using that. So. <laughs> yeah. Until you come up with a better solution, unfortunately, we well, pretty, we stuck with it. We're coming. We're 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 good, but we're slow, you know. Um, what what have you thought about the eight six so far? 
Like you've seen, th- you both have seen thousands of animals killed. I mean, PH of the year, 2015, right here, Andrew Pringle. He did Houston. four days. Houston's four what? fucking days. I did Fuck, six I other hunts with you. I hunted, well, 2015 or, I made a big impression in four days. <laughs> yes. We did pretty well considering we had a gun that was shooting a foot high. Well, <clears throat> an average PH makes excuses. A professional... So I, was, I, was, I think it's, oh, it's, it's oh, been, oh. I mean, it's, shit, it's been not even two years since you first hunted with us. And I remember when you, when you came to the AMCO with the fix the first time and I was like, geez, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the minute you pick it up, you, you realize that, you know, this is something that's going to change the way we hunt. And, you know, it's, it's gone from the 6.5 and, and then seeing all the, you know, all the hunters bring them through Danny and, Ray and all, all, everybody that's come through hunting with the fix and, you know, from 6.5, 3.08 to the, you know, 8.6, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, it really is going to change, I think, the way that, that we hunt. We're fortunate just to have been exposed to it over the last 18 months. And uh, you know, I think the more people that hunt with it, the more that they would realize that practicality, functionality, everything. When I first saw it, I, think, I thought, geez, this thing looks cool but it's probably not going to work that well. I mean, it shoots as well as any other rifles that are out there. Performance, um, you know, a rifle that folds up, sits on the seat next to you, doesn't bang around. I mean, they're, they're awesome. And, they, you know, from Diker to Buffalo, it's, it's really performed. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, it's exciting to me because... I mean, I don't know. You're like a fucking mountain goat. You and your wife running up those mountains every day. You're used to it. You get over there, six thousand feet of elevation, and us fat Americans like carrying that extra five or six pounds sucks. But being able to have this gun slung and it be short. I mean, you think about all the scenarios, Red. You and I have had. I mean, I mean, I hunt with the goat now, but that's just been a few days. But well, I mean, same thing with us, Andrew. We're on top of that mountain the other day, and for whatever reason, there's no one ever up there, and there's a big baboon. He's up there, and he's got nowhere to hide. He's in, As soon as we turn the corner and, and get on top, he's there. He's like, oh, and he oh, tries fuck. to run. I, ha- I have the fix folded in my lap, unfold it, bam, it's done. Yep. What, what's up, my man? But also your you know, your seven-year-old son can pick that thing up. And- well, I mean, I, I was just going to say that, you know, so – I mean, when was it March or so when we were hunting and we'd been looking for a, a, kudu, a kudu for Kevin and it was me, Kevin, Dave and Rad and thought, well, my son Michael was there and, and he wanted to shoot something. And within 10 minutes, we've got the fix reconfigured. It's gone from being a rifle that's going to be shot by a, by a big American man to a six-year-old kid and... You know, half an hour later, this little guy shot a black wildebeest and it just ticks so many boxes. And I mean, on top of that, it's different. It's cool. It's, it almost feels like the industry was ready for something a little bit different. Um, you know, I just look at the, the hunters that see them. I, I've never seen anybody that may initially have been skeptical of, of the fix and what it looks like because it's so different. Once he shot it, He's going to be buying one. He's going to be hunting with one. Now, I don't think it's one or the other, but certainly the, I mean, it just makes so much sense. After a week of of hunting with it in, when was it, 2021? Yeah. I was like, all rifles should be made like this. So, you know, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the ability to adjust the stock to fit anyone, whether you're six feet tall or you're six years old, and the lightweight, the short barrels, the diversity of calibers, um, you know, and the 8.6 has been exciting because we knew we were onto something. You know, when we did 300 blackout years ago, and we had the idea to do the 8.6, 8.6 blackout and everything we've learned in the last decade. Um, but starting the first time I came over with it, we were the 16 inch barrel and we shot big animals with a six pound gun with a 16 inch barrel. We shot kudu. Lutchway, Waterbuck, everything, and we just keep going shorter and shorter. And now, what, the last year using subsonic? Oh, well, the portion of the last year, and we, we started out with Plains Game, and now we've killed Buffalo with yeah. subsonic with a five-pound gun that's this long. 
We, it, it's changed something. What was eye-opening for me today, going to the factory for the first time, was that th this hasn't happened overnight or by mistake. I mean, there's an unbelievable amount of engineering, of design, of thought that's gone into these, into making these rifles what they are. I mean, you, you speak to the engineers, everybody's so proud of, of what they do. And I mean, we were fortunate enough today to build a honey badger and to, and to build a minifix. And th there's a huge amount of, of work that's gone into it. We're just seeing the end result and how well they perform. I mean, at the lodge, we've got a thousand yard range. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they hammering gongs shot after shot at eight, nine hundred thousand yards. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's been exciting. Do you, think, uh, do you think 8.6 would have moved along as fast as it did without hunting in Africa put into the test? Absolutely not. <coughs> you know, I mean, I know what I think my reputation is, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I can have a good idea. Any asshole can have a good idea. Um, and you can do some engineering. You can do some testing. You can shoot gel blocks. But, you know, I learned this with 300 Blackout. Like, I'd never hunted until about the time we were developing 300 Blackout. And we did some of these things. But at the end of the day, you're asking guys to go use it, you know, for survivability to, uh, in combat. They need it to save their lives. And I've never shot anything living with it. I mean, at the end of the day, somebody's got to go out and shoot stuff. I mean, it's the way it is. And... You know, in, in China, they probably take prisoners out and shoot them. We don't do that here. So you got to go hunt. No comment, um, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, we got to go hunt. And so it's, you know, it, it's been exciting, like the, the government that we're working with on the 8.6 on a, a couple hunts ago where we were shooting animals with subsonic. And that's not my gut. That's your gut. But it, it was the, uh, you know, the buffalo, we had shot a water buck, all these big, <laughs> big, tough animals. And their response was, can you guys go shoot some 200-pound animals? And, you know, you know why they're asking. And we don't have the capability. And, you know, other Western governments aren't going to go do that. But, you know, me being the guy that's in charge of this, it's, it's, we go do it. And it, it has shocked me. Thank you, Dory. That's very nice. <clears throat> Two hundred pounder. The bo the bottom line I mean, is you, you remember that, and we, you and I go around for a few days <laughs> looking for animals that are like one hundred and fifty to two hundred pounds, and we're like, Jeez. problem is, is hitting that animal that one hundred fifty to two hundred pound animal with a three hundred fifteen grain subsonic. You smacking four behind it as well. The penetration <laughs> that thing was ridiculous. But it was cool to see the success, and and yeah. you know we have a capability now where we did three hundred blackout for special operations years ago and it's for a specific purpose and this is 3x that and so now you know we're giving guys that are putting themselves in harm's way the ability to use something that's subsonic where you know they can stay hidden and they can make a 300 yard shot on a bad guy or they can use the supersonic and defend you know defend themselves to five six hundred yards with with a gun that the stock folds it's compact it's lightweight it's very mobile i don't know 100 percent. to me you, you kill a buffalo at 50 60 yards with a subsonic it's a thick-skinned heavy-boned animal you got an unbelievable penetration that ran 50 yards and fell over you yeah. know and the rifles perform we've seen that over and over so it's yeah. an awesome product yeah it's 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 cool to see it's nice to have it it's Nice to have it in the passenger seat in your lap. Um, yeah, so when you see something you need to shoot, you can do it with a quickness. Where everybody with a traditional gun is struggling to get it out of the back and get ready and get on the hood of the truck and shoot if it's a jackal or whatever and can make things happen quickly. Speaking of that, we're going to, where we go? We go to Cameroon in a week or two. And so we're taking this. Shout out to Nick Schaefer. The head of engineering and the lead designer on the fix. He built this gun himself, did the barrel and everything when he was at Browning, this Winchester Model 70. And so this is what Cameroon will allow me to take in there to shoot. Rad, is that your favorite animal? Lord Derby Elon? We're going on this hunt? Yeah, one of, eh? Definitely. I think it's the most beautiful. I know you like the bongo. I do like the bongo. 
Bongo is, I'm not saying the bongo is not cool, but it's a, mm, that hunt, everything wants to bite you and hot and humid and you know, chafe cream and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, do you, what do you think their fear is with the fix? They think it's some... Uh, uh, I think for places like that, the folding stock, the look of it, is just something they can't comprehend and it automatically looks like a military style weapon. Yeah. You know, with how you guys have made it look so that it's lightweight and you've cut off everything you can. It's just far too military style for them and it'll just be a clusterfuck if you took it in. So they think we're trying to assassinate someone or something. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's a shame, but it's pretty cool. Get to use a, a gun that Nick hand built. Yeah, and there you go. You know, use it on a aspirational animal. So you and can. hopefully, we get the Savannah buffalo too. Yeah, absolutely. So, did Kevin tell you about the time uh, he got uh, detained in Argentina for his fully automatic fix? Did he tell you this. Case in point, and they're a lot more intelligent than people from Cameroon. So, <laughs> oh, you yeah. can only imagine. <laughs> It'd be yeah. beating beating <laughs> chains volume two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to go to prison in Cameroon. No, but no. it was interesting in Argentina that detained me. I missed a flight. They thought because of the safety, it looks like the selector on an M sixteen, they thought that I was smuggling in a machine gun and faking that it was a, a bolt gun that I was there to like assassinate someone. Detained me, I missed my flight. I had to stand in this little box. It wasn't pleasant. Apparently the policewoman that detained you guys wasn't such a bad problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, quite the liquor and love machine. She's like, <laughs> we can sort this out. That was German engineering. <laughs> <right there. laughs> no, no. I mean, eventually they came around, but it was, uh, I already had an attorney in Argentina by the time they let me go. So, yeah, so, I mean, there is... I mean, I think things are changing. I mean, you see SIG is is copied, um, you know, the aesthetic and a lot of the functionality of the fix, and uh, other companies are doing guns that look like it now, whether it's Christensen Arms or whoever. And, I, I mean, I, I think this is a trend, you know. it's You can't have a steel receiver and a wood stock and the gun be effective in a 16-inch barrel and weigh six pounds. Well, I saw the, the SIG one. They don't have the falling stock. Right, yet. Yeah, they did some weird stuff. It's a on bit that fucking one. wobbly. Hey, it's like a wish.com version. That's like you and I walking back from the pub at like 1 30 a.m. It's just not quite right. <sighs> that one time. <laughs> I mean, that, that one time. Uh, Andrew, how, how was it uh, from your perspective and the PH's perspective when uh, Tori and Amy and Jess, when we brought the girls over there? Sure. I mean, that when was that? Early December. Yeah. Um, guy's still recovering. Um, <laughs> set piece cheeks are still a bit red. So the, uh, the, the boys had a good time, but uh, it was a long, long seven days. Yeah. The, <laughs> the hunt went really well, but no, I mean, seriously, it was, it was fun. The guys loved it. Um, How'd the Q girls shoot? Hey, they shot, they shot well. Um I mean, we shot a good few eland, some lechwe, some water pack, sable. It went well. The guys loved it. I mean, that, that was probably the highlight of, of the year, and it, and it was a very busy year. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's always, they shot really well, but, you know, girls normally listen, um, so generally they shoot well. Um, was odd, without a doubt the funnest hunt of the year. <laughs> a couple of mornings where the guys were a little bit wounded. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw it. We, I, I appreciate where you put my house. Like, I, don't, I don't think I'm don't, away from all the, the nightclub. Yeah, I don't think we wounded one animal with the fix, but geez, there were some wounded PHs. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah, that morning I, I was there at five for you to, and I to go hunt that kudu, and you didn't show up till six thirty. Uh, um, sorry, you didn't show up till six thirty. I was sleeping. 50 yards from a nightclub. <laughs> yeah. Well, to Tori's credit, <laughs> I think she showed up before you and didn't go to bed till 3.30. She and said, to your, it's pretty awesome. Your track record 
It is the first time <laughs> in probably 400 days of hunting that you weren't the last to leave the pub. So at four o'clock when the music died down, I was there's not a fuck Kevin's going to be here at six. And you'd been in bed since 10, so <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, you should. Because if, if you had not done that, we probably would have killed that kudu that I want with the horn and this one goes well, over. Well, I reps. mean, oh, even, though, was that? even though I was 20 minutes late, we still got a, <laughs> you were, <laughs> we got a kudu. You were an a, hour and a half late. <laughs> and a black, uh, my bedroom was 20 meters from where you were sitting. I yelled for you twice. I heard that. I thought it was a buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the fuck it was. When was this? <laughs> like you the, were, the you last were in, Zambia. You were in Zambia. I was sleeping across from the bar. So it felt like Mardi Gras. My, <laughs> my man and I made a plan to, they had spotted that, the skewed, what, well, the, the awesome horn kudu. Mm-hmm. Um, the one you've stubbed your dick on four times. That, that is absolutely a fucking lie. <laughs> um, down by the range. And so we made a plan to, to meet at five and go down there, be the, down there near first light and, and get after it. The same plan that you made like two days before when I was there and you also said like 5.30 and you rocked up at seven. Rad. Do, I'm just checking. Do, do, do you remember, the, track, the, track do you remember the time? Remember the time you were going to shoot that Elon? The guts? Oh, uh, so so um, no, so... Just listen to my story, please, and stop interrupting with lies and bullshit. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so made the plan. So it's Guy, Seppi, Sean, everybody down there, the girls, James. And uh, so had a couple – we had dinner. We had a couple drinks. I'm like, 5 o'clock, I I want that kudu. That is the coolest (laughs) kudu I've ever seen. I go to bed at 10. My house is, you know, way beyond Andrews and everything up there. I sleep so well there, I can't hear anything. Go to bed. I wake up at four. I'm down there by five. Fix myself something to drink, a little snack. Waiting for Andrew. Five thirty. I start cleaning up around there from the party the night before from the girls and the PHs. Took about an hour, get all the beer cans and shit up. <laughs> and then I have time. I clean every gun in the lodge. And I'm sitting there and at about six 15, an hour, 15 minutes later, Dave rolls up and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I'm w- waiting for Andrew. He said he was going to be here at 5. We're going to go hunt that. The goat. goat. The goat. You, the goat. Okay. So he does. Anyway, he shows up at 6.30. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, I, I got up to take a piss at 3 o'clock because the fucking nightclub, the girls and guy that had the music going, I couldn't sleep. And I go back to bed and Julia's like, hey. Turn your fucking alarm off so you don't wake the kids up. You know Kevin's not getting up at <laughs> 5 o'clock. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. Anyway, Andrew comes like, what the fuck? I have to hurry him along. He's all discombobulated, disheveled. Looks like a bruised turd. Get him in the truck. I drive him down there. Within 10 minutes, we see that kudu right where the, the other PH has said he was. So had you been there early enough, you would have shot him. Oh, yeah. I would have been set up. He'd have been dead. So we see him. We're in the truck. He's perpendicular to us. We have to get out. I, I have to run up this mountain. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I look, I, I'm a handsome fellow, but I'm not, you know, the epitome of fitness. <laughs> <laughs> and we run up this hill and all giraffe legs over here. He's already up there <laughs> with his hair, all, uh, his old bed head. Anyway, I get set up on this rock and I'm getting set up. I have to take a deep breath because I'm, I'm trembling. You know, um, I mean, I'm fighting cardiac arrest. And about the time I get on him, I have him in the scope, taking a deep breath. And I'll shoot him walking. He's just walking. I'll shoot him walking at 350. It's not that far. He's a big animal. He's done tell our clients that. Well, I am a professional. Okay. I am a trained professional with hundreds of animals in Africa so under my you belt. turn to the camera and you say, kids, don't do this at home. Don't do this at home. Or oh, Chris as far as. Not even kids. You guys that say you hunt, but you don't hunt a lot. Mm. So then... I get, I get on him, and about the time I start taking up the first stage of that trigger, remember? Mm-hmm. There, there was him and another kudu. They turn and start trotting directly away from us, and all I have is his ass. And I'm watching, 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 think he's going to stop, turn around, look. They're like 770 yards, he disappears. And so we get, we get after it, couldn't find him. It's been hours looking, couldn't find him. 
So disappointing. So had Andrew been a, a true professional, I'm not saying he's not the goat, but he, he's got to get back into fighting shape. Um, yeah, we, we would have the the most incredible trophy kudu in the history of the world, and now we don't. So he's the goat, but he deflated. And the the whole story is all backwards. So okay. if, <laughs> if you remember correctly, that that what you say is true. Oh, but that but was, it's that, backwards. That was the day before when I was up at five, and we climbed to the top of the hill, and the kudu walked out the little draw, and I said, hmm. "There he is, shoot." And I was trying to PH video, get the shooting sticks, show you the kudu, and load the gun at the same time. And the kudu walked, stopped, and then ran away. Then the next morning, because I didn't sleep until four, oh, and the, I overslept, the, and then true. by the time you woke me up, I was a little bit uh, ruffled and out of my comfort zone and forgot shooting sticks, forgot the video camera, and a whole bunch of other things. And we went to the same place where we'd seen the ball the day before. And as... Now I'm trying playing Bob Marley redemption song, trying to <laughs> trying to prove <laughs> prove myself again. And we get to the point the the lookout point where we'd seen that bull, and out comes the one horn kudu. And I thought, oh, that's Fuck right, yeah, me. we did. There he is. Oh yeah, because it's it, like this this one that we're trying everything. to shoot. This horn is good, and this one goes over and wraps around. Yep. And and the one you're talking about walks out. It's got a horn on this side, and this one. And we think it's the so thing. Like everything. It's just a broken horn. He was in the exact same everything spot. Everything will be forgiven. And out runs the kudos. So there he is, freaking hammer him. Running, stops 500 yards. He's shooting behind the shoulder. And as he falls over, so he's another one horn bull. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but not the skew horned ones. I was like, well, oh, I even think that's a lie. I think we're like, fuck, that's him. That's him. And so I get up on him and I'm like, range him, range him, range him. You said 500 or 550 or whatever. I'm like, all right, we're on him. And you're like, fuck, that's not him. That's just another one horned bull. Fuck, shoot him anyway. <laughs> I think that's the way it that's actually what, happened. That's what happened. Though. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great. Anyway. I mean, I tell you, that's the great thing about it. It's an adventure. And when I'm not sitting out there chasing inches, when I'm out there after the adventure, and we're going to have like 100 broken horn animals, skulls behind uh, the bar. It's going to be awesome. Up mm. on the wall. Those are cool trophies to me because that one horn he'll kill he'll kill the big beautiful trophy that your guys will, you know their aspirational kudu. Where yep. that's cool, we've shot those. We get after this skewed horn, one horn stuff. So somewhere halfway between the two stories you guys yep. told is the truth. Maybe. You I just think it's funny because he sat there and let you tell your little story. He didn't say a word about it. No. <laughs> it's it's the most dead, gangster man. shit. I, did, I didn't seen. really have much of a leg to stand on because I was an hour and a half late. I got there, made coffee, breakfast, cleaned the guns. I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I'm, they got even made omelets. Like, I was just bored. I'm not going to hear the end of this. What is it with Kevin and omelets? I love them. They're delicious. Yeah. He's got something. He likes yeah. his eggs anyway. It's just not your, burnt. You've also got to get your prostate checked because you seem to be up at three o'clock in the morning taking a piss quite often. Well, fuck. If you're sleeping 20 meters from where the girls were partying, you'll also be pissing every half an hour. <laughs> you're not drinking. So what are <laughs> you waking up every 20 minutes? <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Well, what was the song that was playing? I can't remember. But I don't know. The, it was, your house is too close uh, to the geez. lines. I didn't hear shit. It was some ridiculous song that was playing at like four in the morning. What was, was it, like, girls? Oh, what were y'all listening to? Bartender. But no, they'll remember. Um, what was it? It's like it, some Jess? Lionel yeah. Richie song or oh, something. All Night Long? You guys are listening to All Night Long? There's no doubt that guy was That's a DJ. That's the one that Madala asked for, surely. Yeah. I think Amy Osford. So if you go to Crusader, let me suggest this. Pay extra, request Guy be there for entertainment. Guy Venter. Fenter. Fenter. Yeah. Fenter. Fen well, it starts with a V. So what is, is, so, is he? He's Afri no way. He's Afrikaans? He's Afrikaans, but he doesn't speak a word of Afrikaans. Well, he's the he, only he Afrikaans that's a good time in all of South Africa? He says he's French. Fenter. Yeah. Okay. He's so Guy Fenter. Who? This is what the fuck y'all are listening to? How'd this keep you awake? I didn't until I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> Why were y'all? Did guy recommend this song? Was guy, someone walking down the hall. Guy was trying to.
This is fucking horrible. You guys need to be introduced to Hours North. <laughs> oh, I, I was. I, was oh, I, I would have been I angry. Upset. Hello, yeah. high water. Hello, high uh, water. No, Guy cool. Fenter. Yeah, so Guy, so pay extra to have Guy there for entertainment. What a good time. Only time I've ever seen a grown man take shots out of the suction cup of a one foot long dildo. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine Frodjum was there as well? Yurks are, Yurks are lucky Frodjum wasn't there. Frodjum and Fent had together. Goodness. Oh, Guy is, he, he's one of the, he may be actually the goat. He is the goat, without a shadow of a doubt. He is so incredible. Mm. Oh my God, what a wonderful human being. Yeah. I mean, he's only 45 years old. <laughs> Just, he's got high mileage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? 45 high mileage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's caught, he's <laughs> oh, what what a legend he is. Uh okay. Well, one of the one of the greatest hunts I've ever been on was with Guy. It was incredible. Of with course. Nick's Nick's Kudu hunt. Oh, I, I would love to see it. Yeah, me too. But yeah. <laughs> 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 so uh Thomas filmed all the engineers the first time in Africa, first time in a helicopter. Andrew was gracious enough to get us a helicopter to cull animals in the mountains. The most incredible thing ever. And uh, so we had like three backup hard drives, and Thomas had simple instructions. Take the video, back up the video. Thomas knew better. Thomas stopped. Back up the video, and the hard drive crashed. And all the engineers, their first trips ever to Africa, their first kudu, their first time in a helicopter, oh, the most epic footage we could ever ask for. Kaiser I, Sose. I feel like Thomas has been ridden pretty hard on this one. If he just sang uh, myself, Andrew, and Tori, happy birthday, he's all forgiven. How about that? Jess, Jess. And Jess. Uh, one happy birthday to Jess right now. I'll never bring it up again. Oh, I don't know about Red and Andrew and Tori, but oh, Jess, fuck, as long as Jess them. gets a happy birthday. Jess, this is like a year ago. It doesn't even bother me anymore. I've, I redeem myself. <laughs> When the 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 one water water buffalo, <laughs> I shot it with a six five in the face. <laughs> that was sick. Though. Hell yeah, yeah. I stood my ground. I redeemed myself. You stood your ground. I did. You and De, you and twenty, De, you 20 and, yards behind the dude with the gun. You and Desmond. With the, with the, <laughs> oh no, no. He's talking about he's talking about the water buffalo. Oh, not in, that. In I Argentina, we're in yeah. Argentina. So so, <laughs> if we have any new listeners. Uh, the very first buffalo we ever shot with eight six, at nine yards, and I look like an absolute legend. Uh, Desmond, our, um, our tracker, and Thomas, it was so close they ran and climbed a tree and didn't video it. Well, Thomas just followed the tracker, which fair enough. If if I was on something you and I saw the, um, Thomas experienced tracker hauling ass and climbing a fucking thorn tree. In your defense, I'd probably follow suit. In your defense, Thomas. Desmond still runs and climbs a thorn tree every time he sees a buffalo, and this is three years later. Me and Desmond are the same size. I don't blame him. Uh, and also, you got a couple pounds in Desmond. And, <laughs> and also, uh, you guys expect anyone? Desmond. Oh, oh. Oh, cool. I do. Okay. The boys Great. coming in. Boys coming in. Coming right. in hot. To be clear, I was filming the whole time. I just didn't hit record. <laughs> I was filming the whole time. That, well, that's that, better. That, that was a cluster from beginning to end. We had a 1914 yeah, Panasonic camera that Andrew thought Sorry? was God's gift to I, cameras. I and borrowed it from Guy. You bought that camera. I borrowed it from Guy. It's it the was same your age, camera. Same age as his binos. As these, we have got a camera the same as the ones that are filming the podcast. You graciously said, I have a spare camera. I said, Which so I never. Andrew, use this camera. It's very simple, small, compact, same. Just red button record. Nah, he's going to use the fucking giant. It already has Kevin's footage he's got on Kevin's the memory footage. card. Andrew stood his ground. Yeah, Andrew oh, didn't run like a bitch. So like completely stubbed his dick on that one. Yeah, oh, we have. We should play that footage now. Andrew's memory <laughs> card had plenty of space till the buffalo stood up, looked at me and Rad, lowered its head. Boop. It's crazy Gone. because like it's right there. Like I have the footage of like the last bit of footage. It's full frame right there. I, I mean, and, and I don't know if Rad and I or the me and the goat kill another 200 buffalo there probably never be a more exciting buffalo hunt Ooh, than that. don't say that bobby i don't know i mean i mean you hope but it's like 
you know, we're so used to it now. I mean, the last video we played, I'm sleeping. And they're 50 yards from us. No. Probably because uh, they're the late night. Mm, I don't know. We were in rural Mozambique and Afrikaans. Dude running camp. It wasn't as fun as Crusader Safaris. Easy. John and I were there. Yeah, you guys are okay. And Dave. John may have been a bit discombobulated. He took a bit of methane, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a video where we're in the middle of this field we're, we're after these buffalo we have to keep going from like one little bush to another little bush and we're behind a bush half the size of this table and the three of us are clumped up and rad is on all fours with the binos sticking through the hole in the bush we're trying you know and of course the one buffalo we want to shoot he's the farthest one he'll never come close to us so this went on for hours and at one point John is back. I mean, he is right against Rad, and I'm beside them, and Rad's on all fours, and John's head is this far from Rad's ass, and <laughs> Rad just rips ass, and John can't move because we're 50 yards from like 12 bulls. And uh, it was the cruelest thing I'd seen in a while. I didn't know John was right there. He, the last time I looked, he was like six well, feet behind me. One little shrub we can all hide behind, and Rad's just... Remember, that's where they came in real close and they turned yeah. and then went away. We had some probably 18, 20 yards from us. That's why he couldn't do anything. Yeah, it was pretty great. But he shouldn't have been that close. He won to the game. I think that was like one of those just internal warning systems. Well, what else should we say about this? Like, I, I can't express how wonderful this has been for me and changed my life and how much I love it and love coming over there and meeting you guys and just the culture in South Africa. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, you know, I've met so many wonderful people there. I mean, think I'm going to two weddings in South Africa this year and, uh, with, with a couple of your PHs, um, that are, are just wonderful. The girls go over, well, Tori had been to South Africa once, but not on a hunt. The girls had never been, they never hunted much. And were nervous and had the greatest time and probably all cried when we left. Um, I mean, anybody that goes. I mean, the messages that I get, the people that have listened to this and go, that send me about going to Crusader and the time that they had. Whether it's, you know, you've had several families that go over there where it's younger children uh, or adult children, spouses, and what a great time everyone has. Um it's been awesome for me. I mean, obviously, I've committed to it. I mean, you and I've got a plane. You let me build a house on your place. We're getting a beach place. Oh, we're gonna hunt from the pontoon boat the on pontoon the river. Boat. Oh, I'm so <laughs> excited! So now we got fishing and an awesome beach place where we went the last couple of days with the ladies and just had a wonderful time. I mean, it it is worth sacrificing so much over here in some of this American bullshit that we deal with to go have that adventure. What do you think there, Thomas? You got something good to say? I see it's, a good, it's a good way to end it, I think. Now, I think a, a good way to end it. If I'm whoever, if I'm somebody, and I'm looking for a place to hunt, why am I choosing Crusader Safaris? The goat. <laughs> fuck the goat. <laughs> no, do not fuck the goat, okay? We don't fuck goats. <laughs> it happens, it happens <laughs> from time to time when the, when the kudu's 50 yards away. Um... I think we've, I mean, we've covered it pretty extensively. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of really good places to hunt in South Africa and Africa. And in South Africa in particular, we, you know, if you're looking for a free range hunt where the animals are indigenous, it's big country, authentic camps, real hunting. Um, you don't really have too many other options other than, you know, other than Crusader safaris. Um, but th that's just one aspect of it. Um, you know, Kevin was touching on it earlier as well, that the the PHs and the people and, you know, everybody that that makes the hunt and the experience is just all good guys. And, it, I mean, it's just a fun time and a good way to go out there and enjoy it, whether it's a father and son or a family or one person on his own. You know, I think it's a combination of all those factors of, of, of the hunting environment, the PHs that really set the tone for the hunt. Yeah, um, and, it, and it sort of all comes together just to create a cool environment to, to hunt in. I mean, you, you think Kristen, who's the homie now, who we hunt with and love, who comes up, builds guns, hunts with us over there, 
we're all there hunting, all the homies, and this woman shows up by herself to hunt who decided at, we'll say, 39 years old to that she's going to learn to shoot and learn to hunt, and that's an adventure that she wants, and comes by herself. It had to be terrifying, but the fact that she comes back now, she hangs out with all of us, she shoots with us, hunts with us, and she's just she's just one of us now that she was comfortable enough over there to also fall in love with the place yeah. and you know have a great experience that what she, she came twice last year she's probably going to go twice this year she was saying um you know and now is like working towards shooting a buffalo that's what she wants to do i mean i, I think that says a lot um it, as far as how hospitable you guys are and accommodating and how it's about the fun and the adventure and it's low stress and you can do what you want and there's no pressure and it's just an amazing adventure i think there's also two sides to the story so i mean we can have all these aspects and make it an amazing adventure and a good time but i really feel in the last two years through q and and you know your help in 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 building the brand and the excitement around the brand Field ethos, Jason, yeah, field J- ethos. Jason Vincent, yeah. um, Brett Voorhees, Ron Dan. It's, you know, it's a lot of young, young, younger, like-minded people who are all coming together to enjoy it. So there, there, there's definitely two sides of the story. I mean, we, we've got a good product. We've got a good area. We've got good guys involved. But, you know, that, that means nothing without a good client base. And for us, it's become not so much a job anymore, but just a fun time because of the people that support us and, and we associated with. And it just seems to be all these young up and coming players in the American outdoor industry that we have on our side. And I mean, we, as much as you guys enjoy hunting with us, we feel very fortunate to have that association. Yeah. I, I think it's uh it's a great relationship. You think all these great friends that you guys have made who this is probably going to be lifelong friends. I made them there as well. I didn't know Brett before that or Ron or Jason Benson or Phil ethos. They're who invited me, Danny and Ray, all these Danny guys, Ray, Kristen, yep. Yep. all these people that are, are, that are some of my best friends now. And we have this experience because that's one thing too. It, it, that, that's a cool thing about meeting people hunting and whether it's your pH, and I'm sure there's a long history of, you know, a bond with a, a hunter and a PH, you know, like, um, you know, going back to where I've talked about on the podcast before going to Queen Victoria's hunting lodge in Scotland, you know, and in, in the last eight years of her life, she just lived there, you know, her husband had passed away and, you know, she hunts with her PH the last eight years of her life. You know, it's like such a cool bond, like that adventure is going to give you a bond, whether it's the PHs or it's people that you meet hunting and you share this experience and this adventure that you can't really explain otherwise. Uh, I, you know, that's one thing that I've realized is, I mean, uh, uh, America is is the best country and the greatest country in a lot of ways, but we've lost our, our way t- in some way. You go over there, and this is kind of like a primitive primitive adventure, and you bond over this thing, over stalking, hunting, you know, harvesting animals, and you know, everything that entails. And and that's something we've gotten really away from a lot in this country. Um, you know, chasing other things. Uh, but it's, it's such a wonderful time. The only thing that I regret is that it took me like 35 years to find it. Wow. So thank you, Rad, Andrew. I love and miss you guys. Had a great time in Dallas. I can't wait to see you. Well, I'll see you soon, Andrew. Rad and I are going to have an adventure in Cameroon. Hopefully, we will not be kidnapped or killed. And we will get a Lord <laughs> Derby and a Savannah Buffalo. And we will have another fucking adventure to talk about that will be epic and a story that we will share for the rest of our lives. Pirates life. It's what we do.